Yeah, so, all right, we're going. Perfect. So hello again, everyone. Um, so this is kind of part two of ethics, technology, and future of medicine. Um, the same affiliations as before, so I won't go through those. I'd like to start off with some different questions. And we're going to just take our way uh, and work slowly through this topic. So just take a moment and think about these questions. What role do technologies have in our lives? How do we evaluate technologies? Meaning how do we decide something's a good technology compared to something is bad? What properties must the technology have if it is to be an object of moral concern? What do I mean by that? That somehow as human beings, we have an obligation towards it, right? that we can't simply treat it as an object that we can throw away. What kind of technological world do we want to live in? Right? So when you look back to where we've been, where we are now and where we're going, are we on the right path? How are you arriving at that judgment? Do machines have the capacity for moral consciousness? Will the moral consciousness of machines ever be the same as humans? And if not, is that problematic? What kind of humans do we want to become if ultimately part of what makes us human is our use and integration of technologies? So we could spend the next hour and a half just talking around these questions, but for, for me, the value of this kind of research is these are questions that we should be discussing now and they should be forming part of the moral discourse in, in medicine. So these are gonna be my take home points for, for the day and we're gonna work through them. So the first is technologies are constitutive of our very being in the world. All right, what do I mean by this? I'm sorry, one second. If you look around you right now on our shared kind of screens and in our presentation, what around you in our world is not a technology? What around you is purely natural? that hasn't in some way been structured or developed as a consequence of our technologies. Any thoughts? It's nice that everyone's names are associated with their screens. And again, Nadia, you left your camera on like super gold stars. Um, I guess I could say um, my cat's just sleeping on my bed right now, but even cats have been domesticated by humans so i'm not sure if we'd be able to consider them as a sort of technology no that's that's a great point like i think i told you guys i just got a, a new dog a new little dachshund right you know to what extent are our dog breeds actually technologies in and out of themselves right as we've bred them to have certain characteristics Right? They are in many ways a biological technology, right? Other thoughts from other people in attendance? Alyssa, uh, Abdul uh, Hamid, uh, Tian, I'm just seeing these names, Charlie, Anka, Shanine, Darian. As a consequence of our technology, I know you're all out there. So Anka asks about mountains. Uh, so I guess mountains have, have, have been influenced, like, you know, you, you can talk about the buildings and clearing of, of timber and stuff, but maybe the basic outlines of mountains haven't changed much. Trees are probably also influenced by us, right? We, we have probably altered to some, some extent the kinds of trees that are around. It's, 
I, honestly, I think it's really hard nowadays to actually look around you and not see some aspect of life that in somehow has been touched by technologies. Whether it's, you know, those nat natural elements that are influenced by our technological impacts on climate change, right? Whether it's the direct actions of coal mining, you know, resurfacing of, of the planet. Whether we talk about, you know, applications like Zoom changing the way that we're interacting with each other right now, just by the fact that everyone here has been given a name at birth and language in and of itself can be understood as a technology, right? So the fact that we have names changes how we relate to one each other because we're identifiable in our singularity because of our name. So my argument would be you, you, you can't actually talk about human beings without talking about technologies. And that's actually very much the concern of philosophy of technology. So philosophy of technology deals with such questions as what role do things, things understood as technologies, um, play in our technological culture? Should we assign agency or responsibility to technologies themselves? What effects do things have on us? How do technologies constitute our humanity? If you look through the history of philosophy of technology, there are three very clearly identifying, identifiable perspectives. And what's interesting in medicine is, is my contention would be is there are many people within medicine who are very ignorant of the fact that these different perspectives actually exist. So, you know, tr tr the traditional kind of old perspective of technologies is technologies are instruments, right? They are things that we simply pick up and we put down and we simply use them, right? So they have what's called instrumental value, right? Um, and if we wanna understand a technology, we simply look at it as its use. Uh, a classic example of an instrumental way of thinking about technology would be saying something like, guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? The guns are simply a tool that we use. They don't at all shape the way that we interact with each other. That way of looking at technologies as far as within media ecology or philosophy of technology has become fairly um, outdated or considered to be naive. Um, because technologies, we don't simply use them. They have effects on our sensibilities, on the way things are present to us. They affect our perception, our actions. So in response to this kind of instrumental perspective is the idea of a singular transcendental perspective. Um, when we start to say that technology changes our very culture. Now, why it's called a singular transcendental perspective is uh, the philosophers who kind of identify with this perspective often talk about technology as far as all technology. So they don't necessarily make distinctions of, you know, how is the technology of industry different from communication technologies, right? How are social networking uh, technologies different from musical instruments, right? Um, but rather simply looking at technology in and of itself, all technology as either being a bad thing or a good thing, right? Technology will save us. That's a transcendental singularizing perspective. That's also become outdated. We've moved past that turn. And where we really are now in philosophy of technology is we're looking at technologies empirically, meaning that we shouldn't talk about an iPhone in the same voice that we talk about an MP3 player or an amplifier or a refrigerator or, or a spaceship, right? Or genetic engineering technologies or fetal diagnostic technologies or therapeutics. All of these technologies affect us and our way of being in the world in very different ways. Does that make sense? 
I'm seeing some comments in the chat. Sorry, I totally forgot to have that open. Uh, technology, life, the mastery of fire has shaped our evolution. It's integral to our species, right? Um, so, you know, you could say talking about technology life, that's a, a singular perspective of technology, unless it's qualified to say what technologies have shaped or changed us, if that makes sense. I don't think necessarily think that's what you meant, Tian. I'm just uh, responding to it. So I wanted to introduce a few different movements within philosophy of technology that I think are helpful to, um, to, to, to both physicians as well as academics and, and people in the general public to, to start thinking critically about technologies. Because ultimately, um, one of my contentions is there's a value in thinking reflectively and critically about the technologies that we have. Um, so we can start to ask these questions around ethics and morality. So one such movement is post phenomenology. Um, so phenomenology uh, basically is the study of lived experience. Okay. Uh, the aim is to try and understand how is it that we directly experience being in the world. And post phenomenology is recognizing that our experiencing of the world or our being in the world is a mediated experience. So technologies are always already present in the way that we're conscious of the world. My consciousness is shaped by technologies, but different technologies mediate my experience of the world in a manifold of different ways. Now, the, the main philosopher associated with this movement is someone by the name of Don Eide. He's an American philosopher. He's written many books, many articles, um, but there are other uh, people who followed him. One of the basic ideas of this movement draws from the tradition of phenomenology. And the idea is that for the most part, um, technologies, when we incorporate them into our routines, when we use them with expertise, we no longer think of them as being present, but instead they quite simply structure our world. So most of you are probably not thinking that you're using a laptop right now, if that's how you're joining the presentation. You're probably not thinking that you're wearing headphones right now. You're not thinking that you're wearing glasses or contact lenses, or that you took some medication this morning that maybe affects your mood in a particular way, right? We've simply, incorporated these technologies into our life and they're part of our direct experiencing of the world and the way we directly experience the world is one in which we don't necessarily constantly reflect on how everything is shaping our experience does that make sense now one of Don Eide's contribution was to start to tease apart different ways that different technologies shape our experience. And he draws different relations. So one would be an embodiment relation. So how do I tend to use a pair of glasses? I embody them, meaning that when I'm using them, they become part of my body and part of the way that I am relating directly to the world and I become indistinguishable, indistinguishable from them. And for some of these technologies that we embody, they become so routine um, as part of our being in the world that the world actually becomes strange without them being present. So going back to the experience of glasses for people who wear them, I don't feel normal in the morning until I put my glasses on. Right, because that's become part of my way of, of interacting with the world. That's how my perception is shaped. And there are many other technologies that we embody, right? Beyond, um, you know, glasses, of course. So whether we're talking about clothing, whether we're talking about, you know, handheld tools like, you know, a hammer or a utensil, right? Um, you know, cane assisted devices or whether we're talking about medical technologies. So those that we directly implant into us, like a pacemaker or a ventricular assist device, right? 
but these are embodiment kind of relationships, which is very different from a hermeneutic relation. So in a hermeneutic relation, a technology doesn't become part of us, but rather it interprets the world for us. So it changes the world that's present. So the classic example of a hermeneutic uh, technology would be something like um, a thermometer, right? We look at the thermometer as a thing that's apart and different from our body. And it tells us something about the world, which allows it to see the world in a particular way. It discloses the world as a quantified temperature, which we then interpret as hot or cold. Make sense? Which is different from an alterity relation. This is when I encounter a technology as an other to myself, right? So this could be something as simple as, you know what, my car Betty, I've given my car a name. And when I talk about my car, I talk about it as this thing that I'm attached to. And although my wife wants me to sell it and get a new car, I kind of like Betty, right? Or my iPhone that sometimes is just not working and I swear at it and call it names other than Siri, right? It becomes an other to me. And then there are those technologies that sit in the background of our life that we often give so little attention to, but none the way very much structure how we are in the world. Right. So the fact that, you know, most of us right now are in some room with some kind of heating or air uh, circulation technologies. Right. We don't think about them unless suddenly we're finding that we're too cold or we're too hot or there's a funny noise coming from our thermos. Or we notice that our water heater is broken and now we're in a wet basement. Right? Now, um, Although these are, are drawn as distinct, clearly different technologies can occupy more than one relation. So the example of a car, cars can also be embodied, right? A car can be in the background uh, of, of my relation. It can become an environment, right? And then there are other kinds of relationalities that have been developed, like the notion of a cyborg intentionality. Any questions about this so far? So one way of beginning to think critically about technologies in our world is starting to identify them and then asking that question of, well, how is it that this discloses the world to me? How does this shape my world? In the last uh, presentation, we began by talking about ethics is always already present, right? as a kind of a first condition for understanding ethics. If we understand that technologies are also always already present in our world, then technologies are constitutive of our ethics, right? And depending on how they shape our relations with the world and with others in the world, they in and of themselves express an ethics. So, a technology like a stethoscope expresses a particular ethics. When as a physician, I put on a stethoscope, the child becomes present to me, not as a little baby, but as a heart to be heard, right? It discloses particular aspects of the child in a different way. Right? Um, in the same way that we were talking in the opening about, you know, medical students studying neurology right now. Well, what, how does a MRI of a brain injured baby disclose that baby in a different way to a parent? And they start to make decisions about him or her. There's an ethics to that, right? Because it changes the way the other is present to us. There are hermeneutic technologies in medicine. You know, imaging technologies are a good example. There are those that are in the background. This is from my world, it's an incubator, right? And clearly, as many of these technologies start to, to work together within systems, they, they condition our, our sense of subjectivity and our sense of otherness, right? So for, for, for my world in medicine, uh, neonatal perinatal medicine or NICU, we have to be constantly attentive to how are these different technologies that we use, not just keeping a very preterm baby alive, 
but how they how do they shape a way shape the way that a parent comes to know their child how does it shape the way in which they make decisions for their child that we make decisions for their child particularly when we're dealing with decisions about continuing medical care or discontinuing medical care so any questions of this this first point technologies are constitutive of our being in the world Oh, you guys are making my life so easy today. I'll be done actually on time. The techno-ethical question fundamentally considers how, do how does a technology weave into human life affecting our perception, decisions, and actions? Okay, I'm now gonna show you guys a little video I don't remember exactly how long it is. And it's um, an interview with a French philosopher called Bernard Stiegler, um, who passed away this, this past summer. Um, and one of his most famous books that he wrote is called Techniques and Time. Um, and it's very much about how our humanity is, is structured by technology, right? So it's a little bit philosophical, but I'm hoping it, it causes you to reflect and start thinking about things in a different way. Un jour, Zeus a dit à Prométhée, « Le temps est venu pour toi, pour nous les dieux, de faire venir au jour les non-immortels. » Les non-immortels, ce sont les animaux, les hommes. Or, Prométhée, qui est chargé de faire ce travail, a un frère. Ce frère, c'est son jumeau, il s'appelle Épiméthée. Ce frère Épiméthée, il a pour caractéristique d'être le jumeau, le frère jumeau de Prométhée. Il lui ressemble, il est tout à fait de son double, mais il est de son contraire également. Épiméthée, c'est le dieu du défaut, de l'oubli. Prométhée, c'est celui du savoir, de la maîtrise absolue, de la mémoire totale. Prométhée n'oublie rien. Épiméthée oublie tout. Or, Épiméthée dit à son frère Prométhée, « Zeus t'a chargé de faire quelque chose, je veux m'en occuper. C'est moi, c'est moi, c'est moi qui m'en occupe. » Et comme euh, Épiméthée, c'est le frère un peu simple d'esprit de Prométhée, Prométhée a de l'affection pour son frère. Il n'ose pas refuser. Il dit « D'accord, tu t'en occupes. » Donc, Épiméthée va se mettre à distribuer les qualités. Il va donner, par exemple, à la gazelle la vitesse. La gazelle court très vite. Au lion, la force et l'endurance. À la tortue, la carapace, etc., etc. Bref, il va distribuer des qualités qui sont équilibrées. Ce que décrit la distribution des qualités par épiméthée, c'est l'équilibre écologique de la nature. Le lion court après la gazelle, il mange la gazelle, mais comme les gazelles courent très vite, il y a toujours des gazelles qui se reproduisent, que le lion n'attrape pas, et tout ça, tout va bien. Toutes les espèces sont équilibrées. Donc, Épiméthée distribue toutes les qualités, et puis d'un seul coup, il s'aperçoit qu'il regarde dans son panier, il n'y a plus de qualité. J'ai oublié de garder une qualité pour moi. Le panier est vide. Or, oh, il me reste à créer, à, à faire venir au jour, comme dit le Dalai l'homme, enfin le mortel. Il y avait encore une espèce à faire venir au jour, 
mais il n'y a plus de qualité pour lui donner une forme. Du coup, Prométhée est obligé d'aller dans l'Olympe, dans l'atelier des Faïstos, voler le feu. Le feu qui est évidemment le symbole de la technique, mais qui est aussi le symbole de la puissance de Dieu. Zeus. From the, from the river bottom. Pourquoi me suis-je donc tourné vers Prométhée et Épinée En disant, si nous voulons comprendre la question de la technique telle qu'elle se pose à nous aujourd'hui, les hommes du XXIe siècle, nous devons nous retourner vers la mythologie des Grecs anciens, pas simplement la philosophie, mais la mythologie tragique des Grecs anciens. Si j'ai pu dire cela, c'est parce que cette mythologie des Grecs anciens pose précisément correctement le problème, dans les termes de la mythologie, bien sûr, et de la religion grecque primitive, de la religion tragique des Grecs. Mais il pose incroyablement la question comme elle doit être posée. Prométhée va voler le feu, c'est-à-dire la technique, c'est-à-dire aussi l'intelligence d'Athéna. Et l'homme va être un être vivant, mortel, il va être condamné à se fabriquer ses prothèses, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'a pas de qualité. Il est sans cesse dans l'obligation de se doter de nouveaux artistes pour survivre, et surtout, étant donné qu'il n'a pas une qualité définie à l'avance, eh bien, les hommes entre eux entrent en conflit les uns avec les autres pour dire quelle est leur qualité, quel est leur avenir. Les uns disent il faut faire ceci, les autres disent non, non, il faut faire cela. L'animal, le zèbre, la gazelle dont je parlais tout à l'heure, la vache ou le lion, ils n'ont pas de questions à se poser sur qui sommes-nous. Who are we? It's not a question for an animal. Mais pour l'homme, c'est une question éternelle. Qui sommes-nous Est-ce que nous devons développer des computers Est-ce que nous devons aller sur la Lune Est-ce que nous devons euh, raser cette forêt Construire ce barrage sur le fleuve de Hölderlin Est-ce que nous devons faire ça La technique, c'est la question. Dès que je suis technique, je suis en train de questionner. C'est la raison pour laquelle, d'ailleurs, Zeus va devoir envoyer Hermès. Zeus va devoir envoyer Hermès. Parce que les hommes vont se faire la guerre entre eux. Ils se posent des questions, ils n'arrivent pas à se mettre d'accord sur les réponses à ces questions. Donc ils se massacrent. C'est la fameuse guerre civile qui fait tellement peur aux Grecs. Ce que les Grecs appellent la stasis. Et c'est un fait historique. Les Grecs, à l'époque où Platon raconte ce mythe à travers la bouche de Protagoras, eh bien, la Grèce vit la guerre, les guerres du Péloponnèse, c'est-à-dire la guerre entre tous les Grecs. Je vous disais tout à l'heure que l'homme est un être qui adopte des techniques nouvelles, des noms nouveaux, des idées nouvelles, sans cesse, des œuvres d'art nouvelles. L'adoption, c'est la guerre. La possibilité de l'adoption, c'est le risque de la guerre, sans cesse. Protagoras raconte que Zeus va envoyer Hermès, c'est-à-dire le savoir de Dickey, la justice, pour éviter que les hommes s'entretuent et s'anéantissent eux-mêmes.
Mais pour que la dickey soit devenue nécessaire, il faut d'abord qu'il y ait la technique. La technique qui est à la fois la prothèse, l'artifice qui permet aux hommes de survivre à son prédateur, c'est ce que raconte le mythe de Prométhée et d'Épiméthée, mais la technique est aussi le support de la mémoire, comme je vous le disais tout à l'heure. Le support du livre, qui est le livre... Attends, je te donne une seconde, si tu veux bien. Le livre qui est une prothèse, qui est aussi ce qui va servir à Hermès à écrire la loi. To write the law. You know? Allô So we can stop that that video there, and and I'll certainly send out the the link when when I send out the the presentation as well. The the reason I wanted to share that that video with you is, um, for one, I, I I'm going to be honest, I really like it. Um, I, I love reading uh, Bernard Stiedler, and I think his his presentation of of humanity as far as being somehow originally deficient it is, a, is a nice way of just showing how intimate our relationship to technology is. Um, that we are technical human beings. We have the capacity of embodiment, right? To take on a technology and for it to become part of the way that we apprehend our world. But because of this so-called deficiency and this prosthetic understanding of technology, we're also confronted by this perennial question of how do we want to recreate ourselves, right? We can't talk about technologies as something out there, as meaning this separate thing that is going to somehow develop, but rather as human beings, the technologies we develop change fundamentally who we are and who we will become. Um, so for him, this is the ultimate question of philosophy, right? Technologies are not external to our being, rather than are what makes us human as we are realized as technical beings, forever constituted by and constituting technology. This means that as we create technologies, we also are recreating the sort of humans that we are or will become, right? So, you know, the next big app or, or the next big program, that recreates the way in which we interact with each other when we talk about social networking or, or other social media kind of technologies, right? When we begin using different kind of um, you know, new implantable technologies such as ventricular assist devices, mechanical hearts, Berlin hearts, transplant uh, devices. We're not just physically recreating how we are, but we're also recreating what it means to be human, right? How we understand the nature of a finite life, right? Um, so really, this is a this is the question for humanity. And this is the question that I'm hoping all of you will spend time thinking about. I, I think I showed this the, the last time, uh, the last semester of this course. This was a picture now taken a few years ago at the legislature grounds, pre-COVID, huh? What a different world we were living in back then. And uh, this was the summer of Pokemon Go right, where you saw people of all ages going around hunting for Pokemon, not necessarily even looking up at each other, but instead looking down at their screen and swiping at these imaginary creatures, right, spending countless hours um, engaging in such activities. Any questions about that point? Okay, so if we understand that technologies are constitutive of our being in the world, and we understand that this is actually a fundamental question then for ethics, we need to also ask how do techniques constitute our own moral consciousness of the world? So last week we talked about moral experience, right? 
And I gave you this definition from uh, Frank Carnevale, and I think it was Michael Hunt. And I talked about these different elements as being present within moral experience, notions such as uh, historicity, right? Uh, notions such as temporality, notice a uh, notion such as intersubjectivity, right? So the question then becomes is, can you imagine moral experiences without technologies? It, and honestly, my perspective would be would be no, because if we're if we say that moral experience is ultimately an intersubjective event, right? It's conditioned by the presence of others within the world. Well, others are disclosed to us by nature of our technologies. The, the history of those who came before us is disclosed by how we write those histories and how those histories are captured, right? If we think about the history of the ancient Greeks and how we interpret and understand it, that's going to be different from how people interpret our history 50 years from now and they're able to look back at TikTok videos and you know YouTube channels, right? History is presented differently by nature of the technologies that record it, right? Technologies structure the flow of, of consciousness, right? As they shape what is uh, remembered and what is presented. So in both the retentional and protentional uh, qualities. Technologies help define the limits of our experience. Does that all make sense? So this is in part why moral experience is a socio-cultural phenomena, right? But it's also a temporal phenomena. And I would go so far to say as moral experience is a socio-cultural, temporal, technical phenomena, right? And what might we might decide as being okay or good now is very likely to be different five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Thoughts, comments from the group about this. This is stuff you probably already know and have thought about on your daily basis as you fall asleep at nighttime with your head against a pillow, which is a technology in and of itself, right? So last class, we started talking a little bit about some of these um, depictions about technology and the future. And I think at one point we were talking about, um, you know, is it ethical to eat meat? Uh, and Kim said that he's now a vegetarian. And I explained, exchanged a virtual high five because I'm a vegetarian as well. Um, and the question was, you know, how would future, um, how would aliens or other cultures actually view us given how we treat animals or other beings that we perceive to somehow be of lower intelligence, right? Or a lower position in our, in our life. And I mean, this has clearly been explored in, in the media, right? And I think one of the nice examples of this is, of course, the, the Matrix, right? And I'm assuming everyone has now seen this movie. Please tell me I'm not too old for having seen this movie at this point. Um, but really, the idea of uh, some technological civilization or some technological entity essentially becoming dependent on humans for nourishment. And yet as humans, that's not okay, right? So we have to now respond to this. And of course, this matrix uh, civilization of, of technical beings is, is cast as the bad guy. Although it, that's not really clear to me why, why that's necessarily so. Uh, we could just as easily make a a movie from the perspective of, you know, an animal farm, right? And say, how are humans depicted in that situation as well? But a question that I'd, I'd have for, for the group here is, what are your thoughts about um, technologies as far as the idea of um, some future technology actually having a moral 
consciousness or being able to make decisions about what is right or wrong and how they view humanity. Do people see anything problematic with the Matrix movies aside from maybe Keanu's acting? Hi, um, actually I have a question about, um, uh, yeah, uh, so earlier I think you said something about ethics expressed by technology yeah. or our current technology. I, I have a trouble distinguishing um, the difference between expressed and associated. Okay. So I, I can definitely see that uh, like stethoscope is associated with like certain morality, but it, it can't express morality by itself, right? So I, I think we're talking about here um, whether or not technology can make choice on its own. So I, I think um, when we talk, when you're talking about uh, the language of express compared to associated, um, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, let's just leave that question off to the side because I'm going to come back to kind of designing technologies that express a certain morality. Because this question people, people have come to before is, is the technology itself moral or immoral? Or were it the designers that designed it? Or were the people that used it or employed it? Um, can technologies have agency? And I think that some of that comes to be a semantics question. Um, and ultimately you can make different arguments with different technologies in a different way. For this example, I'm talking about more this idea of um, technology as an entity, right? Can technology as an entity now separate from human beings actually express morality? Let me give a different example. We all know the Terminator saga, right? Um, and the idea behind the Terminator movies, as I remember them, where that essentially this new program uh, is launched called Skynet, right? And Skynet essentially as it is launched becomes self-aware of itself and deems that humanity uh, threatens its very existence. So essentially launches war on humans and then it becomes a question of survival between humans and technology, right? What I'd like to hear from the group, is that story flawed? Um, I do have some thoughts. Okay. Um, so what I was thinking, I mean, with from everything that we've talked about in this lecture so far, uh, I mean, it's very relative, like morality given, you know, your, your own individual experience, plus the technologies and, you know, the basically the era and the community that you're in will change your relationship to what is moral and what isn't. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you have Skynet or this super intelligent alien race, they'll have a very different sense of morality than we would. And so morality really has to be defined within groups that you kind of share the same worldview, same, um, a lot of these like you know uh, like same technologies just a lot of a lot of similarity and identity that you share with multiple individuals that would make up morality for that group otherwise there isn't I, I don't feel like there is a universal morality like it will always change depending on the situation you're in yeah, and i think that was said extremely well anyone have any have any other thoughts to what tian just said just adding on to that, I was just thinking like, because, um, you know, each technology has its maker, right? Therefore, the maker's morality is sort of considered in the design and stuff. Like, I know like a couple of popular examples, like, you know, like in a car, if you don't put your seatbelt on and the drivers, it'll start beeping. You know, like that's a design aspect that that's like sort of the morality of the society sort of implemented into the technology itself, right? So I guess it'll just be a whole different field when technology starts making itself, because then it's implementing 
its own morality, I guess, that others implemented into it, into its own like creations. So I don't know, that's just like a thought that I had. One thing that I, I wonder about when I see these kind of depictions is in order to, to make the actions of, of Skynet recognizable for, for us, we have to somehow take Skynet and we put it into human form, right? The Terminator, right? We have to take the matrix, right? And put it into human form, right? So all these different agents running around, right? But if we were to really think in the future about some supercomputer technology, right? That was so advanced relative to our, our grasp of the world, it would also have a different consciousness of the world because it wouldn't apprehend the world through a body in the sense of yours or mine. It would be, I would imagine, somehow have a sense or awareness of not just what's in the here and the now, but also in the everywhere, right? Or what is at the limits of its perception. And its perception would also potentially be different than ours. You know, you and I, we have eyes, we have ears, we have a nose. These are our kind of organs of perception. But what would the organ of perception of a computer or other technology be if it wasn't necessarily reduced to that form? So, um, you know, what, what's, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think all these are great movies because they make us ask questions and think about something in a different way. But if we're really taking the question of, um, you know, technology, moral consciousness seriously, it's actually really unclear what it would look like and whether we'd even be able to apprehend it. And frankly, whether we'd even care about us Right? In the same way that there are certain aspects of our world that we completely pass over and are indifferent to. Unless we have a, a narrow academic interest in ant colonies, for example, right? They're just not present within our day-to-day -day view. Other thoughts people had? Hi, um, I feel like with all these movies too, um, uh, so going back to the Terminator example, um, I don't think the like the robots that are killing people are necessarily a moral agent in the sense that it wasn't like they're getting commands from Skynet, right? And mm -hmm. Skynet is following like set of calculations to arrive at which action to take. So there isn't that element of moral agency, I feel. So we, we can't really judge like whether or not it's acting morally. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a good point as well, Ted. Ted. Um, I mean, we're just talking around these things here, right? Like I'm not trying to tell you that my opinion is the right one or you know what, Tian got it right or Nadia got it right or Ted got it right. There isn't necessarily a right answer here, but I, I'm, I'm more interested that after this, our time together that people are just thinking about these questions, right? Because these are actually very, I think, important questions to have discourse around, right? Um, I imagine many people here have watched episodes of Westworld, right? Apparently it was one of the most popular HBO kind of offerings. Um, you know, and what's interesting, you know, before it gets absolutely crazy and graphic violence, whatever, um, is that the way it almost presents this moral awakening for the characters, right? When they start able to remember past actions and they're no longer just living life in the moment, these created uh, beings, but rather they somehow have a sense of past that they then reflect on to start judging their actions, right? So one can even ask that question of, if we wanted to design um, some kind of cyborgian or technological being, what qualities would it need to have in order to have the same moral grasp or ethical grasp 
of, of the world that we do. And that's when it, it becomes necessary to start asking what are these structural components or aspects of, of moral experience. But on the other hand, it's also very possible that um, something very different and new will emerge. The other thing that's also important to acknowledge is coming back to the previous point is how we tend to develop technologies is we don't develop them independent of us. So as we develop technologies, it's also likely that we're not going to be developing some technology that somehow operates independent from us as some independent singularity, but it's also possible that the technology that we develop is rather a radical reconfiguration of who we are in the world, right? So then it's not a question of um, some future technical morality. It becomes a question of what does a future human technology morality look like, knowing that we are constantly changing who we are as humans. Does that make sense? All right. So Ted, I'm coming back to your, the question that you asked earlier um, or the point that you were raising with this next point. So many moral perspectives can be codified into technologies such that designers, engineers, and so forth do have moral ethical responsibilities. And there's a well-established history of this. So we don't necessarily need to imagine some exotic technologies that haven't been conceived yet. Um, and this is one of the famous examples from philosophy of technology literature. So I'm showing it because um, it, it's a nice example. So this is uh, Langdon Winner's Bridge. Langdon Winner is a philosopher of technology who's written a lot about technology and morality. And he wrote about this, these bridges that are uh, located in the United States that were supposedly designed by Robert Moses. Um, and these bridges line the parkways. Um, and essentially what they do is, um, yes, they allow people to walk across the street without getting hit by a car, which would seem like a morally good thing, right? Um, but on the other hand, these bridges have a, a limited height to them. And where these bridges are constructed or were constructed were overlaying the roads that went from the uh, urban areas down to the beaches. And so there is a, a judgment in Langdon Winner's writing that these build, uh, bridges have morality built into them. And the morality that is built into them is that people who are disadvantaged, who rely on public transportation um, who would need to take buses to get down to the beach um, should not be afforded that opportunity. So this bridge essentially hangs too low for buses to get underneath, which means only that privileged, which at that time was the white class, uh, would be able to access those public spaces. Right? Now, clearly now we look back at that and we say that is completely inappropriate, right? We need to make things accessible for people from all walks of life, and we shouldn't disadvantage any racialized groups. Um, but at the time, this could be said to express a morality. Now, the question can come to who is ultimately responsible? Who is the moral agent? And there are different people who've written different, you know, articles and texts on this. So um, some people will say, you know what, the designer is ultimately the moral agent. Other people would challenge that assertion, like uh, Peter Paul Verbeek, who talks about machines bearing morality. And there are other writers who talk about being morality somehow being shared the two within their interactions. Um, one useful way of looking at such technologies is actor network theory. So again, I'm just introducing these concepts to people here because um, maybe it will be useful for some of you sometime in your, in your research or your future work. So actor network theory looks at technologies as essentially as bound up with humans in socio-technological collectives. 
and it actually puts both technologies and humans on equal footings, referring them as both human and non-human actors. And that if we want to understand the morality of these systems or how they function, we need to understand all the different relational effects between them. And there are various technical terms that are used to kind of um, explain these relationships like delegation, translation, composition. Um, and the idea is that when these actors work together, both human and non-human, they enact some kind of an agenda or program for action. And here's one of, uh, so Bruno Latour is the person who coined the term actor network theory. And here's one of his classic examples. So for Bruno Latour, um, we can look at speed bumps as forming or as part of a network, whereby essentially the role of the policeman has been delegated to the speed bump to essentially enact a program of causing cars to slow down. And ideally these speed bumps should be employed in areas where it's a benefit to society to slow down, right? So having speed bumps around schools would seem to be a good thing. So essentially they help to affect morally good action. And um, in our first session, we talked about how morality can be located theoretically um, in different ways. So we talked about deontology as an example, where morality is located within prescriptive rules, right? Or obligations, right? Thou shalt not kill. Well, here's a nice way of saying thou shalt not speed, right? So it's easy to see how some of these theoretical frameworks for conceptualizing morality can essentially be enacted within these networks. Does, does that make sense? Um, and you know, what's, what's important to acknowledge is sometimes that these, these networks or these actions are very deliberate and sometimes they're not deliberate, right? So sometimes designers go out of their way to cause humans to act in a particular way. There's this really nice, uh, I wish I could find the picture. Um, there's this nice Dutch book on, I think it's called Designing Morality. Um, and they go through different examples of technologies that are apparently good technologies. And one of them is this couch. And what's so unique about this couch is it's composed of multiple layers of fabric. And when you first start using this couch, it's like a nice kind of blue velvet. Um, but as it wears over time and that blue velvet is worn away, you see a different layer, a different color, right? And then over time, as that layer is worn away, and it exposes another layer of fabric to the point that um, the value of this couch is realized in, in the sense that this becomes an object that isn't temporary in one's life. It's not just that couch you buy at Ikea that's gonna last you for two years, right? But it's a couch that you live with and grow with and it encourages sustainability. So that's why it's considered morally good but what is it expressing? It's expressing a particular understanding of what is morally good as far as not living in a culture where we throw away everything, right? But rather we should have uh, you know, respect for our environments. These are some nice examples of different benches, right? Which may or may not have been deliberately designed uh, for uh, encouraging a particular way of using it, right? Um, and you know, one interpretation of looking at these different benches is that these benches were designed to encourage people to sit and to rest, right? And then get up and walk away again. But what they made very challenging is for people who don't have somewhere to sleep to use them as a place to actually lie down, right? So they essentially are saying what is a good action or good use of this bench is, you know, 
I need a rest, I'm gonna sit down and put my feet up for a second or enjoy the park. But what is a bad use would be to loiter in the park and sleep there if you're potentially homeless, right? And you can see that by, you know, the New York bench, you know, has these dividers that makes it impossible to lay down on. This public bench in Tokyo, the same thing. This beautiful French bench in Montreal, again, mounted on a wall, you can't sleep on that. So the only nice bench is the one that's within Edmonton, right? We are, we are the place which encourages uh, a more democratic way of, of using a bench. Oh, and this was from initial around the COVID-19 pandemic when they put spikes on some of our benches to prevent people from gathering. From gathering. Again, expressing a different understanding of morality. And there was quite a response to this uh, in the media. Um, is this actually a good thing um, to essentially limit the use of, of these, of these uh, public places uh, by, by making them essentially unusable for people who rely on them? So my last take home point from the talk today is that reflection can support how we as a society develop over time. And I didn't want to spend a lot of time through that, through this point, so I didn't actually put any particular slides in it. But um, these are my kids from a couple of years ago. Um, but the basic idea here is that you cannot understand a technology just in the room where it is being designed. Technologies ultimately, when they are used, are often taken up in ways that we didn't anticipate. And for me, I see this more often than not around children, right? Where I'm constantly correcting them on how to use a particular technology, but they find a way of using it in a way I never thought of. Um, and, you know, I have a sense of what they should do but they have a sense of what's enjoyable, right? Um, when new technologies come into existence or come into use, there's a value in constantly reflecting on them because uh, ultimately the best way to uh, inform future design is evidence-based design, right? Whereby as something is designed, we study its use and then we look at redesigning it accordingly. And so there's a whole movement within design uh, which, which looks at different aspects of design, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, person aspects, so person-centered design or usability, or more theological, or you're looking at the ends of design, uh, and that's a whole talk in and of itself. So at that point, I wanted to leave time for uh, questions and comments um, and see what people's thoughts are about these different points that I've raised. Um, and whether there's anything people would like to return to, to talk about. Um, I, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, do you believe there's a universal human trend in technology creation and use? Like something ornate to, or like something innate in human beings that guides our direction of research, what technologies we find important, how we use them, that sort of thing? I, I, I think it's, um, I mean, so my personal belief here is that there isn't something generally innate about, about humans that, does, that defines what is a, a good compared to a bad technology. Um, but rather we can reflect on aspects that shape the meanings of our, our life in a particular way. Um, most technologies have both positive and negative um, effects to them. So to talk about an, a technology as simply good or simply bad um, is, is problematic, uh, but rather there is value in, in constantly reflecting and actually saying, how do we like the way that this technology is, you know, affecting our life? Is this one that we should continue to use or how should we look at, at redesigning it? Um, so how I approach that in my own research program um, is I do a lot of qualitative research. Um, 
So an example I mentioned uh, was in the context of places like the pediatric intensive care unit. This is a picture of our, our PICU uh, at the university hospital prior to moving into single rooms. Um, and I, I just did a study there where I spent time with school-aged children who lived with these mechanical hearts um, and, you know, went around and actually, you know, interviewed them and talked to them about their experiences of living with these devices. Um, I have a little Iron Man picture with this because when you're engaging in qualitative research with children, you don't sit across a table and interview them with a microphone. You engage in play. And so we were playing with Lego when he was telling me this um, anecdote about, about his ventricular assist device. The actual device inside of my chest sometimes makes a hum or, or, or like a kind of a buzz. And if I put my hand right onto my chest, I can kind of feel the vibration of it. In a really quiet room, I can hear it. Sometimes during these times, I just can't help but think that I don't want it anymore, that I just want it taken out, that I'm just done with it. Um, that's a, a powerful thing to hear like a 14 year old say, to talk about a device that's frankly keeping him alive, right? But when you start to think about, well, what is it like for you know, a young child or a teenager to, to live with something where they're hooked up to a battery that they have to carry everywhere with them, um, where they have to cope with a technology that they can't fully embody in the sense of ever forget is really there, where their parents are constantly watching them because they know if they, somehow snag their drive line, which is the wire that connects from the battery to the, to the device itself. And it comes loose that the, the, the mechanical heart will start, stop pumping. You know, there are dimensions to this device that we need to consider from an ethics perspective beyond its instrumental utility in keeping a child alive. And ultimately in medicine, we're not just interested in keeping our patients alive, right? On a ventilator or some other technology forever. We're not interested in keeping bodies alive. We're interested in, in supporting people to have a good life. So we deal with these questions around, around meaning. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question or skirting it or just wanting to show a picture of Iron Man, but um, just to give you a sense. Other questions, comments? Um, I was just wondering about how the most of the technologies that you give examples, they are like more beneficial to the human being. But I was wondering more of like guns and like things that are made for destruction or things like that. Like what is the moral conduct in regards to that? For sure. So, I mean, you know, m many technologies, um, you know, you know, take guns, for example. I mean, clearly, if, if you're living in, in a part of a world where you're dependent on hunting for your food supply, um, you don't necessarily look at a gun in a destructive manner, right? If you're living somewhere where your security is threatened because you actually need to protect yourself from, from the harshness of, of, of nature, for example. A gun in of itself is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, but on the other hand, when we think about something like, like a gun, um, then one does need to ask the question of how does that shape the way that someone else is present to me? And the reality of, of a gun compared to, you know, other destructive devices is, um, and I don't know this personally, so I clearly can't say this, but, you know, there's a concern of, well, just how easy is it to pull the trigger, right? Um, should we be designing such technologies where it does become so easy to kill? Right. And that's where people have also talked about things like, you know, drone technologies, right, that are used in warfare. Um, should we be designing technologies that actually take the human element out of killing, uh, knowing that it then becomes easier to look at other people as potentially obstacles or other objects compared to actually 
being present before us, right? Um, clearly guns allow you to, to kill at a distance without even seeing someone's face, right? Compared to something like a knife, for example, right? But all technologies have, have positives and negative dimensions. Um, there's another philosopher of technology called Albert Borgman. I'm not sure if people have read any Albert Borgman. Um, but one of the technologies he loves to write about is, is the hearth. And th this notion of like um, the hearth, by hearth I mean that place where you prepare food, like the fire, in like those older style dwellings, that this how being in, in some way a good technology because it gathers people together. Um, because meal times used to be a, a time when people would gather together and talk and socialize and engage and there would be time spent in, in cooking. But on the other hand, you can look at technology like that and say, well, that's a very romantic perception of, of a hearth. Think about all the trees you're killing to keep the, the house warm, right? How environmental is this? Like, is this a good technology? So you can look at them differently, but again, the value here is reflecting and ultimately coming to decisions about what do we as a society want. Let me uh, insert a, a sort of technology point here. I think you should unshare the slides. So a part oh, of this right. recorded video shows actual people. Otherwise, no one will believe that we had real people here. So yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah. Okay. That's all I want to say at this point. Okay. Any other questions? Or? Yes, sure, Kim. I have a comment, or I, I don't know if it's really a yeah. question. But I think, like, as regards, you know, designers um, implementing moral ethical principles in, in the products they produce. Like, I think that, like, for at least designers, in, in my view, that their, their responsibility is just to give as much choice as possible to the consumer. Um, like, you know, it, it's up to the consumer to use the product in whatever way that they see is moral. And, and maybe the goal of the designer should be to restrict whatever, you know, intentions they have um, from, from manifesting in their products, because then you can get good things, you can get bad things. But, um, you know, if you have sort of an, if you aim for neutrality or, or, or the absence of morality in your product, um, I, I think that's a, that's a great ideal. And then you just have um, people uh, using it for um, what, what they think is valuable and useful in their own lives. So, so Thomas, I, I like your point. There, there's an argument I was trying to make, and maybe I didn't achieve it, was there is no such thing as technology neutrality, because technologies have both uh, positives and negative dimensions to them. Um, but certainly one can take a very liberal perspective and say, look, you know, the job of a designer is to produce products. Their responsibility is to the people who fund their company. Right. And ultimately, their responsibility is to make money. And as a consequence, you know, we've had issues like, you know, the uh, we were I was just doing a, an ethics talk earlier that Charles Ells was uh, leading and he was talking about the opioid crisis. Right. And the people who marketed uh, OxyContin, right, which was made their company tons of money. But as a society now, we're dealing with the consequences of having such an ultra short acting opioid available that people could essentially chew and very easily get addicted to. So yeah, you can leave it up to physicians and, and patients to decide whether they want to use something or not. But as a society, we do bear the consequences of, of what is designed and what's produced. Yeah, I just wanted to speak for a moment about Osmer uh, Zayan's clip that I sent to you all, um, in which he says, uh, we should teach morality to machines, and then they will be more moral than we are. So you, you can imagine and, and it's hard to know whether we're to regard this as being positive, but if <clears throat> sentient machines become definitely smarter than human beings, they will probably develop some nuanced forms of kind of moral reasoning that are beyond what we're able to do. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to, you, you asked whether they could be as good as we are 
But what about the side of them being, quotes, better than we are? And, and so that then is saying, well, would they be still working on our behalf then? But suppose that they had built in the idea that they are working on our behalf and they, so these big things we can't solve, uh, global warming, nuclear war, and so on, they might be able to solve those things. So their nuanced understanding would benefit us all because they can fix things we can't fix. We would wake, wake up in the morning and you know, pollution is gone, everything's greener, the oxygen level is higher than it's ever been, CO2 lower and so on. But as, as a part of that, they might have things that they think we should do that <laughs> we've, we've never thought of. So is that a side that, that you can even, you know, conceive of, Michael, or, or is that beyond what you will get? Well, I mean, we already have that. I mean, in, in the sense of, you know, we can program into different devices a certain moral code, right? Or a certain obligation, right? right? So we could program into cars right now that, you know what, you're not allowed to drive faster than this. Why should anyone ever need to drive faster than 120 kilometers an hour on a highway, for example? Yet we design our cars to go 220 kilometers per hour to exceed the speed limit in any region of, of Canada. Why is that? Sure. Right. So the question of designing morality into machines, one of the questions ultimately has to be whose morality, knowing morality isn't singular. Um, also, which, sorry, when's morality, because morality isn't static. So what might be morally okay today might be looked at in a very different way tomorrow. Yeah. Then the, the last part that I, that I would say is I struggle with this notion of uh, a technology which is supposedly smarter or more advanced than us being more moral than us. I think it's possible that if we did have sentient um, machines and we'd have to define what sentient even means, um, that they actually have a morality that's completely other to ours, of a different texture than ours, that it's not necessarily even recognized along the spectrums of good and bad, because there's there's something else shaping that balancing. Um, yep. So it's uh, what the one issue with so many like the media depictions of of you know these post apocalyptic or future oriented movies is ultimately we're still looking at what's morally good and bad from our contemporary subjectivity. Yeah. And it's very hard to look at a grasp of the world from anything other than our current subjective grasp because that's the epoch we're living in. Um, so, you know, where I like things like post-phenomenology or actor network theory or even, you know, Marshall McLuhan's work, if we wanted to think of someone Canadian, is it, it introduces different heuristics or different ways of actually asking, like, how do we understand the way this technology shapes our life? Yeah. So you, you can imagine that machines might definitely understand human happiness better than we do, it, even what it is, but also how, but is that really what we should be aiming for or what they should be aiming for? And then, so, you know, it, 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 it gets you back to the real meaning of life. If machines are working on our behalf, what should they be working toward? Because whatever it is, they'll probably become better at it than we are. So we don't want to give them the wrong goal, right? So anyway, it's a very interesting question. If I could jump in quickly, like yeah. along those same lines, like uh, once we can define whatever technology to be like sentient, then that changes how we morally treat it because yes. suddenly it's like, it's a being, it becomes like an other sort of. So, you know, as Dr. Van Manen mentioned, how like morality is always changing, we might have moral codes based on 
how we treat technologies that we don't like cuss at our phone when we get frustrated right. or something like but that. Let me just point out that in my first lecture in the course, I required you to memorize and be tested on Rich Sutton's idea about exactly that. When machines are smarter than we are, how should we treat them? So there are, you know, exam questions on this. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not saying that he's, he's right, but what I am saying that in 2005, he was, uh, you know, singular in this. I'm, I'm sorry, 2015, I think there was this AI safety uh, conference in January 2015, and he was the only one not favoring enslaving AI. Everybody was talking about how to keep sentient AI in a basement, prevent it from you know communicating, prevent it from actually acting on on the world. And so, what what you're required to be able to reiterate on, on the exam is his his answer that we should treat them with uh, empathy and, and include them in our uh, circle of empathy. You know, it's, it's like somebody new, some new human that you meet at, with somewhat different characteristics. So that, that's a required part of the course. But what, what's so challenging is if we, you know, imagine how we should possibly treat a technology that's sentient. Well, we have other sentient beings already in our world that we treat fairly horribly, right? Um, so it, it is very problematic to somehow assume that we have some kind of a privilege as human beings, whereby we are due more um, in, in our future uh, relative to those sentient beings who exist currently with regards to how we treat them. So that's yeah. the argument from like animal ethics, right? Yeah. 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 I suppose yeah. that goes back to like social psychology, like in-group, out-group dynamics. Like that's still going to be there. That's just such a human thing. And it's not going to go away because we suddenly have this code of ethical conduct towards machines. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was also going to say, like, it, you could also posit the question that is it even ethical for us to create such a general intelligence, this upper or just different sentience that operates on a different scale than we do, that might have a realistic, like moral conflict there, and we would actually make ourselves an outgroup or have this segregation, having made this technology. It's like a technology we can't integrate anymore, because it doesn't operate within, within our bounds. And so could you even call that a technology? It, would it even be moral to create such a such an entity? So I jump in a bit. Um, I think if the question is whether or not we should rely on technology to, to decide what's moral or not, uh, if we look at things like uh, like spelling checks or uh, you know supercomputers that look at a bunch of data to formulate like a weather forecast. I, I think we already have systems where we rely on machines to like process information and push out a uh, answer at the end. So I don't think uh, like uh, people trying to, you know, create some kind of ethical framework is necessarily diminishing like human capability to make decisions for ourselves. Like we'll just consult it every now and then, but I don't think it will overtake our ability to, you know, question ethical questions or right. have morality. So th this is another thing that you're sort of required to know. So at a certain point, tech writer Yuval Noah Harari said that in the future, all human culture would be wrecked because machines would be the only acceptable way to make major decisions. So when you're deciding what to do with your life, who to marry, where to live, all these things, the people who decide those things for themselves would end up in a very inferior state versus the people who put those machines to 
sentient who put those questions to sentient machines. So therefore, because the plot line of every movie, novel, play you've ever liked revolves around human decision-making, human culture would be wrecked. And I argue that it's exactly the opposite, that if we have that kind of intellect that we can uh, make uh, work for us, that our human culture would obviously much be much better than it is now. And one way is that we would be able to run multiple lives at once. FOMO is gone. <laughs> You'll never have a conflict of, of two things occurring at the same time and deciding which to go to. You'll be able to do both. Um, and he, he accepted that. So he has stopped saying that human culture will be wrecked. And, and but it is interesting to think, how is it, it, it exactly going to work? I think that's, that's not so clear. Uh, but machines are already able to make other, other machines. And there are whole factories where there's only a human being there. Uh, you know, you don't really need any humans for the factory to be going. Those factories work very well. They, they don't necessarily need the lights on. They don't need heat. They're, they're, it's a lot easier to make things if you don't have to uh, keep uh, humans uh, happy. Other questions? We, we are over time. Uh, Michael, I wanna thank you very much. And in those moments where my subjects make you uncomfortable, I'm very grateful for, for your, you know, tolerance of, 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 of things like making radio resistant humans and all, all the things that we've forced you to talk about in the past. Oh, I, I'm, thank you so much again, Kim, for having me in your, in your class. I, I have to say, I, I really look forward to being able to spend any time with you and, and your class. These are always really interesting Great. questions. Great. Good. Well, I, th I, I think the class only gets better. That's what ha happens. It kind of evolves every ter term and the next term is even better. So you, you have that to look forward to. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. And uh, next time we're back to quantum biology with Simon Wu. So, okay, bye-bye. Thank you.